Hello, and thank you for joining us. My name is Caroline Malier. I am a resident fellow in finance, insurance, and trade at the R Street Institute. I am subbing in for this event while Jerry Theodoro is out of the office dealing with a family matter. Insurance fraud is the second largest category of white collar crime, surpassed in size only by tax evasion. A blight on our economy, insurance fraud impacts every property and casualty insurance line. Life and health insurance are also targets for insurance fraudsters. Insurance fraud ranges from individuals cheating on insurance applications to save a few hundred dollars to sophisticated multi-billion dollar rackets involving dozens of complicit attorneys, doctors, and adjusters. The total cost of insurance fraud is a staggering $300 billion a year. If insurance fraud were to be eradicated, insurance premiums for individuals and businesses would be reduced by approximately 10%, rather significant. During today's event, we will gain an understanding of the nature and magnitude of different types of insurance fraud that have long plagued the industry. Our discussion will shed light on the many types of insurance fraud, new trends, and how it can be mitigated. We are joined by Michelle Rayfeld, Executive Director of the Coalition Against Insurance Fraud. Michelle, perhaps you'd like to start by introducing yourself as well as telling us a bit about your organization. Sure, I'd be happy to. Thank you. Uh, my name is Michelle Rayfeld. I'm the Executive Director of the Coalition Against Insurance Fraud. I assumed this position uh, this past January. However, I am not new to the organization. As a former member of the organization for more than 12 years, I participated in working groups and in collaborative efforts amongst its members, and it, it was really a special time uh, for me as a regulator at that time because I got to learn firsthand from the industry what was going on out there in the world of insurance fraud. For the coalition itself, it's really a very special organization. It was formed over 30 years ago by 17 organizations representing consumers, insurers, and government entities, and we're really the nation's only alliance uniting such a wide range of groups in the fight against insurance fraud. And today we're extremely proud of the fact that we have grown from 17 members to more than 300 member organizations. We're also proud of the fact that our diverse membership gives us a high degree of credibility with uh, legislators, regulators, the media, the courts, and most importantly, the general public, because it tremendously assists us as we initiate uh, meaningful reform and look to protect both consumers and the insurance industry from fraud. And just to give you a little bit more about our organization, our mission is simple. We serve to unite and empower public and private groups to fight insurance fraud through three different things, outreach, advocacy, and research. Through virtual and in-person forums, we facilitate discussions on emerging trends, technology advancements in the industry, best practices, and challenges that face us in our anti-fraud efforts. And our collaborative, collaborative, I cannot get my words out today, collaborative approach is really strengthened by the work that's completed by uh, our members on various committees and task forces that we've set up over the years. So it's really a, a unique organization and really effective uh, when we get our minds together and start talking about the issues that are out there. That's great. And you're certainly doing some some very important work, which I, th I think is something that uh, you know, a lot of people probably aren't aren't super familiar with. Mm -hmm. So, and I I would say people may tend to think of insurance fraud as harming sort of big multi billion dollar businesses, or maybe they don't even consider the harms at all. Can you tell us is insurance fraud a victimless crime? It's not. It it it, it really is not. In fact, it's truly what we say the crime we all pay for because insurance carriers have no choice but to pass on the cost of fraud to consumers in the form of higher premiums. And I don't think consumers understand that. In fact, insurance fraud actually costs every consumer $932 a year. It costs the average family more than $3,700 a year. And for every individual out there during their lifetime, $73,000 a year. So just think of that as an individual, what you could do with that added money you know, if it wasn't being lost to fraud. Yeah, absolutely. That's very significant. 
Uh, and and so we touched on this a bit about uh, uh, how big insurance fraud is, right? So um, what about sort of, uh, do you have any, some, some numbers on on more of a national scale of how many, how much money we're seeing per year that's wasted on fraud? We do. And it's interesting, uh, you know, being with the coalition for so long, for years, and I'm talking decades, there was this magic number of 80 billion out there being used um, for, it was the most cited number out there. Well, years ago, we decided that, you know, we really needed to look into that figure because we knew it was outdated. And so two years ago, we unveiled the results of a study that we had done with the help of numerous strategic partners in the Colorado State University Global Chapter. And as a result of that, and you mentioned it earlier, we were able to identify that $308.6 billion is lost to just insurance fraud each year. And what's scary is that number is already outdated. Our study was done two years ago. So each year that is increasing and increase, in increasing. And, you know, when, when the study came out, I wanted to figure out, you know, gosh, what could I buy with $308.6 billion? So I did a little research. I got on the Internet. And if I were to go shopping with that amount of money today, I could buy 134 Empire State Buildings. Uh, if I were a football fan, I could build 250 brand new NFL stadiums. Uh, if I do actually have children. And so, you know, in looking at college educations, I could actually fund 12.3 million college educations. If I were a truck lover, I could purchase 4.1 million Chevy suburban trucks completely decked out. And then if I was looking to buy a home, I could buy 880,000 middle class homes here in the U.S. And, you know, so that hopefully that was eye opening for me. And I hope it really helped shed the light of how much is lost. And that's every year. Every January 1st, that number starts over from zero. So that's what you can purchase every single year, just with the amount of fraud that is stolen uh, from insurance carriers each year. I mean, there's such staggering numbers that it's always uh, interesting and almost enjoyable to hear sort of those those comparisons. So I appreciate that. Um, and so we see fraud kind of ranges from from tiny fraud, as I mentioned, cheating on on insurance applications, uh, all the way to uh, large schemes. So we see staged accident schemes that may uh, be upwards of tens of millions of dollars. Can you maybe talk a little bit more about the staged accidents and how those schemes work exactly? Sure. Yeah. Uh, you know, with staged accents, it's really interesting because you have sophisticated groups of criminals out there. I mean, there's organized crime out there that we are all dealing with. And it's in with staged auto accents. A lot of times you have a group of individuals who they've identified an insurance uh, product out there. Um, and so they will they'll do a number of different things. Um, they'll they'll target in innocent individuals such as yourself. You may be driving down the road and they may box you in and the individual in front stops short on purpose while their, their cohort behind you smashes into your car and causes you know, this chain effect. Um, they have uh, organizations where everybody knows each other and they, they go out and they get junk vehicles and they uh, organize an accident and stage it to look as if something happened, never call the police, you know, never bring in, but then all the, you know, they start going to doctors and the ERs and claiming they were in this auto accident and taking pictures of this. So it really gets into some very elaborate schemes. And then some are purely on paper. Some never happen at all, but they just take the, uh, the information uh, from stolen uh, vehicles or vehicles that they've purchased and start using that. We've When I was a regulator uh, and I oversaw our fraud unit, uh, we had individuals quick deeding uh, vehicles to one another. Uh, we called it the Nissan case. We had an old 2012 Nissan that had been used in more than 100 staged accidents here in Ohio and carriers had paid out close to $100,000 on an old Nissan that wasn't even worth that much. So, but it was be just because it, it, it's kept changing hands and being used as part of these, these bogus schemes. So it really is an issue that's out there. It drives up 
you know, they try to drive up the claims uh, in terms of medical. They claim people were in the car when they weren't and get others involved. And so it, it really becomes costly, you know, as carriers try to fight all of this. So. And insurance, of course, is regulated at the state level. So are there certain states that we see are more susceptible to these schemes than others? It, it Every state is susceptible. Okay. And it's interesting because uh, all the state departments of insurance talk to one another uh, through an association that they're with. And the fraud directors of the various states have regular communication about what's going on in their states because typically we'll see it start in one area and spread all across the country. So there really isn't a state that's immune from fraud at all. Okay, sure. And so it sounds like with uh, the staged accidents, we the, the, the primary target there would be car insurance, right? But are there, what sort of lines of business are the most subject to insurance fraud? Does car insurance stand out above the rest or perhaps maybe another line of, of insurance? Every line of insurance has its own unique piece. I cannot think in all my years of one line of insurance that has not been hit by fraud. Your personal lines of insurance, your homeowners, your auto, those are the most common that we see, but also, you know, healthcare fraud. And um, we've got uh, consumers obtaining auto coverage after an accident and trying to pass it off as, you know, damage that took place while they were insured. We've got People hiding their cars, claiming that they were stolen, mm -hmm. uh, or even uh, homeowners or renters ransacking their uh, homes or apartments, making it look as if there was a burglary, uh, and then staging you know, a, a claim for that. Um, we have on the workers' comp side of things, you've got injured workers who are faking accidents to be off work. You have legitimate workers who are off work, but then they go and double dip you know, they claim they can't come back to work, but they go get another job so they can have two sources of income coming in. Uh, we've even seen injured workers falsifying the medical documentation to stay off work longer, you know, when their their doctors uh, are returning them back to work. On the worker side of comp side of things, you also have employers committing fraud where they commit what we call premium fraud. Uh, I recall one uh, company years ago, you know, that I investigated, it was a construction company, yet they had every employee as a secretary. Mm -hmm. uh, on the healthcare side of things, you've got medical providers billing for services not rendered, or uh, we even in severe cases, uh, we've had medical providers actually diagnose people with conditions they don't have to justify the need for added and expensive testing that they're going to then be reimbursed for. Um, you'll also see on the homeowner side of things, contractors committing insurance fraud. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of times after a, a huge storm and all the legitimate damage has been repaired, you'll see them on the outskirts of where that storm took place saying, hey, I can get you a free roof paid for by insurance. And then they actually, there has been no damage, but they go up and they manufacture damage. We've seen them manufacture what they think looks like hail or pull up shingles to make it look um, like wind. Uh, and the new uh, trend that is out there is what's called tarping. You know, you may have one shingle that has blown up or has a little bit of damage. Well, they'll cover the roof with these big black or uh, blue tarps and they'll uh, nail those tarps in over the whole roof rather than that one little area. Well, guess what? Now you've got hundreds and hundreds of holes in your roof that need to be replaced. And so, you know, we, we see that. So again, it could be committed by anybody and depending on the line of insurance, you know, there's a scheme out there for, for everything. Um, I will say uh, one of the areas really being hit hard is the life and disability uh, lines of insurance right now. Uh, and there we have a lot of individuals uh, being victimized by identity theft. And so mm. that's a concern. Uh, you, you do have false false claims being uh, taken out there or you know being made uh, beneficiary issues where people are forging changes of the beneficiary when those in fact weren't done, uh, just be out of greed because they want the money when the, the person passes. But we are seeing quite a bit in the life, disability, and in, in annuity uh, markets right now. 
Okay. And I'm, I'm actually, I'm based in uh, West Palm beach, Florida. So I can definitely attest to the, uh, the contractors and the, and the roofing storms after storms. <laughs> That's been a very, very big deal in Florida in years past. And, uh, we ho hopefully, have, uh, put, uh, the legislature here has hopefully put forth the, the, uh, the legislation that has, has largely done away with that. But of course there's always another scheme, right? I mean, there, there's always something else right around the corner. Um, and, and in that vein, we have heard reports of sophisticated fraud schemes that are really taking things to the next level by incorporating artificial intelligence. Uh, so can you tell us a little bit more about how exactly that all works? I can. And, you know, the industry has been having lots of discussion on this. You know, technology advancements have absolutely revolutionized, you know, fraud detection, prevention, um, even investigations. But at the same time, it, we say it's been a double-edged sword because it's actually causing new opportunities. And that's where these sophisticated criminals are, are coming into play. You know, we're no longer dealing with just your policyholder potentially submitting a false document or, or making a false statement we're dealing with very sophisticated cyber criminals out there who are using online platforms and AI uh, to, especially in, in the areas I just mentioned of the life insurance, the annuity uh, market uh, and the disability markets. And you know what they're doing, they're, they're purchasing valuable information out there about all of us on the dark web. And they are turning around and using that to, uh, say that they're you calling in to say, I want to cash out my life insurance or my annuity that has a, a cash value in it. Um, we're even seeing on the disability market that they're taking consumer data and they're taking out policies and you know making the first month's premium only to turn around and file a claim, you know, and it's it's not the person. And so, you know, the carriers are really having to, to deal with quite a bit, bit of that right now. And I wanted to, I thought it'd be interesting to bring up, I read a, a story about two or three months ago about an overseas company that was defrauded of close to $25 million. And this company, the whole fraud scheme started by an email compromise scheme. And that fraudster reached out to that company. They got a hold of someone who was in charge of the purse strings uh, and then went on to orchestrate a Zoom call where they used the images and voices of company personnel who are above that person to orchestrate a Zoom call as if it were taking place amongst the three of them to then authorize the payment of five million, five, five million dollar payments to the fraudster's bank account. And I, it was not an insurance company. It did not hear, happen here in the U.S., but I want to bring that up because some of those same tactics are what our insurance carriers are up against today, especially in the life, disability, and annuity world. The technology is so good that these bad actors are successfully defeating the voice recognition systems. Think of all the videos that are out there of people with their voices. That could be taken and manipulated and used by these fraudsters. They're uh, bypassing uh, signature recognition systems. And then even the anti-fraud systems that insurers have in place because they have all that key data that they've purchased off the dark web from you know data breaches that are out there of all types of companies or um, even just email compromise schemes or hacking of computers. And so it's really scary. We're dealing with very um, you know sophisticated criminals and many of these same criminals, they're not here in the US. Mm -hmm. They're doing this all from overseas and abroad. So you know, I was just on a panel a week or so ago where they said, you know, these are organized crime groups. They have their own buildings that they work out of and go to work every day to do this. And they're specifically looking for, um, you know, organizations in the insurance industry, the financial industry, you know, in the business industry to target for vulnerabilities. And so identifying them and really bringing them to justice is getting that much harder because of the overseas aspect of it all. So it, it's really changed over the years. I've been doing this over 30 years. And, you know, from the time I started to today, I'm just amazed at what we've seen. So 
Oh, yeah. The schemes have gotten on, like you said, not just in insurance, but across the board have gotten very, very sophisticated. Absolutely. And I've even read in terms of the voice recognition, they only need like about a 10 or 15 second clip of you talking and they can parse anything together. Yep. Uh, so it's 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 sort of incredible even. But what do you see as the 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 way forward to to combat this specifically in insurance? Um, well, and that's where our groups like ours come in. You know, we are we are collaborating. We have committees and task forces that work on a regular basis to come together, talk about friends and trends in the industry, talk about you know tools to combat this, best practices, what's working, what's not working. You know, just staying apprised uh, of what's going on, and then two, you know, strong legislation and partnerships with both law enforcement and prosecuting agencies, both of which who are, are members of our organization. And so, you know, the key to all of this is communicating and establishing those relationships so you can work together quickly so that if a, a problem or a new trend is identified, that the groups can start quickly addressing it and coming together to put an end to it. Okay, yeah, absolutely. So um, switching gears here a little bit, you have a survey that shows that young people are more comfortable with committing insurance fraud than generations past. What can we take from this information? And do you have any thoughts on what can be done to combat yeah. these sort of shifting attitudes or, or where exactly these attitudes come from? Yeah, and it was interesting. So after we did this, you know, the cost of insurance fraud, we turned around and did a study called Who Me? Who Commits Insurance Fraud and Why? And we did uh, a survey with a company where they found representatives from every single demographic from across the country so we could get an accurate picture of what consumer thoughts were towards insurance fraud. And just like our, our cost of insurance fraud survey, we were absolutely shocked at what we found uh, because one of the first things the survey pointed out was 15% of everybody surveyed no longer views insurance as a crime. And they also said not only did they find it acceptable, but it'd be something they'd be willing to engage in. And you know, if you take that 15% and you apply that to the total population of the US, we are now looking at 50 million Americans who don't view insurance fraud as a crime. And from that same study, what we found was those 45 uh, and younger, I'm sorry, 44 and younger, 18 to 44 uh, range, don't believe insurance fraud's a crime because they don't believe they're personally impacted by it. Mm -hmm. And so what, and what was even more concerning with that is that 20% of those same individuals said they were envious or jealous when they found out someone they knew had committed insurance fraud, and that was even more of a motivator for them to do that. So, you know, as you can imagine, that's extremely concerning to us. If you're in your 20s, 30s, and 40s, and you're lying and cheating and stealing and, and think that's okay, what are you going to do when you're older? And, you know, the problem only stands to grow worse as, you know, the generational attitudes change. So to get back to your question, um, you know, that's where uh, our organization feels a national insurance fraud awareness is needed. I think, you know, I don't fully believe consumers understand what insurance is and what its purpose for. It's not something to get rich off of. It's something for you to be made whole should a catastrophic incident take place. Um, but also it does impact us. As I talked to before, we're all consumers. We all buy insurance at some point, whether it's for our auto or home or our rental uh, unit, whatever it may be, health insurance, you know, we're all impacted by it. So we're all paying the cost because it, the insurance carriers will go out of business if they can't pass on that cost that, you know, they have to allocate money to, to pay claims and keep that in reserves. And so, you know, there's only so much you can do if you're, you know, to keep the, the premium. So they have, they have no choice but to pass that off to consumers. So I think some type of awareness program and education program of what insurance is, what it's for, and how it does impact everyone would be extremely beneficial uh, in changing consumer mindsets. 
Yeah, I agree. I think unfortunately insurance is very sort of demonized even. Uh, it has such sort of a negative connotation because it is frequently associated with catastrophic situations, whether that be to your health or to, to your to your home, a car accident, what have you. And uh, there, people tend to have some frustrations to say the least when when trying to file claims and different things. So, um, but but some absolutely some awareness around how vital it is as a as a pillar of our overall economy. And yes. as you said, the individual impact that occurs when insurance fraud takes place. I mean, you see that you see, like you said, that the, it trickles down. Those costs go to everyday consumers. They drive up the costs for everyone, and that's a real shame. So, um, is there any? If I can bump jump in there, you know, with you being in Florida, look what's happening in the Florida market. It's become mm -hmm. too costly, and insurance carriers will go under if the costs are too high. So you've got carriers having to pull out so they can continue to provide insurance in other states. And so now you have consumers who are having difficulties finding insurance and just think what happens then if you don't have any type of coverage, you know, there's nothing to fall back on. So right. you're absolutely right on that, that they are demonized. And I think pointing out the importance of what the role they play in, like you said, our overall economy is really key. So mm -hmm. yeah, and, and in Florida, in particular, we've now seen an over reliance on the state backed system, which is completely unsustainable, certainly. And I, I think there's a lack of understanding of the repercussions from that as well, um, both with with you know, just taxpayers and and what we're pouring into that system. But also there are certain assessments that can come down in the wake of a really big storm that can have a serious financial impact. If there was a to be a huge storm that hit the state and uh, the state backed insurance system had to pay out billions upon billions, they can ultimately come and assess the private insurance policies as well. That would be catastrophic for the for the state and for the residents of the state. So uh yeah, we 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 want to absolutely always reduce any um reliance on on state government and that's kind of what you end up pushing people into, right? When when um when when the prices get driven too high by fraud and and, and other things. So it's it's definitely a big issue. Um what was there was there anything else in your survey that really surprised you besides the attitudes of young people? Not not just the overall, I, I personally was just shocked by the whole thing. Um, you know, growing up, you know, I, I, I was a little different. I was a finance major also. And so I understood what insurance was uh, and the importance of it. But, you know, I think I was just blindsided by the fact that really by the changing attitudes and the drastic de decline of, of consumer attitude, the negative decline really blew me away. You know, I expected to see it a little bit, but not to the extreme that we did. And so I think that was my, you know, you couple that with then the sophisticated cyber criminals we're dealing with. And mm -hmm. so I'm starting to lose, you know, sleep. <laughs> so we've got our work cut out for us, but we absolutely do it. Yeah. Well, thank you, Michelle. And I think that we've got a few minutes. If anyone from the audience would like to ask any questions, there should be a um, Q&A box where, where you can submit any questions that you might have. So we'll give people maybe a couple a couple seconds here to, to submit anything and see if we can get some questions answered from, uh, by Michelle. Okay, well, um, looks like no questions today. You covered it all, Michelle. So we thank you so much for your time and for for joining the R Street Institute Finance, Insurance, and Trade, uh, and and providing your very interesting um, perspective and expertise on on insurance fraud. And we really applaud applaud the great work that that you're doing, and and hope that we can really get the message out about how serious these issues are. So thank you so much for for joining us today. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. Take care.